The scripture reading this evening will be from Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and, and there he tested them, and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Going twice. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. Uh, there's never a full set up here, if you've noticed. It's always one or the other. So, so one of you is walking around with one in your ear and your little lopsided. Uh, it's, it's up here if anybody recognizes it, little pink earring there. So good to see you again. I was just sitting there thinking uh, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. You know, when we come together like this and we circle around God's Word, uh, everything gets right. Uh, it, it's kind of been a, an odd week. Uh, I don't know uh, how much of the news has made its way around. Received some news this past week that, uh, you know, we went down to Belize early April. Uh, we baptized three precious souls, uh, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, I believe one on Monday. Uh, the lady that was baptized Sunday morning, she passed this week. She had cancer. She was young. Uh, in her 30s. Didn't look like she was that far gone with it, but uh, she's in heaven now. And I got to thinking how close we came to not having a campaign in Belize this past April and how we're going to see her in heaven now, uh, whether we wouldn't have before. Uh, we, we received some news this week. You might have seen it in the Birmingham News. A sweet, dear lady that came forward. She visited with us on April 10th. Her name was Leanne, Leanne Stripe. Uh, she was over from Talladega. Uh, she was in the DHR system awaiting a court case here in Birmingham. We went and visited her at her group home on the 11th or the 12th. The last time she was seen alive was the 15th. They found her dead this week. It's, it's just over and over again. We've had so many in our hospitals this week. Uh, you heard that uh, Sister uh, Betty, Brother Johnny, uh, lost a home this week. Out there we deal with so much, don't we? But when we come together around God's Word, seems like everything gets right again and we understand who we are what we're doing here that we will make it through that God loves us and it's so good to be with you to come together on God's word right now and to worship with you and to study with you we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26 the name of God which we find there tonight the Lord your healer I remember there was a YouTube video that was making its rounds uh, this has been several years back, and it was an Australian animal enthusiast. It wasn't Steve Irwin, but if you had have seen it, you would have thought, well, there's someone trying to be Steve Irwin. He was doing the whole, the same get up, uh, getting out in the bush and playing with dangerous animals and, and videoing it. And uh, in particular, he was photographing a cobra. And this man was just, it was ridiculous what he was doing, really, because he'd be playing with this thing and try to get into the bushes, and he'd go grab it by the end of the tail and drag it back out. He'd be crouched down with his camera in one hand, and he'd be doing this with his other hand, trying to get it to, to pose for him. And it'd be hissing, it'd be striking, and he'd be getting right up in its face and taking pictures. And it was just, I was just cringing the whole time I was watching this thing. But he's so lighthearted about it all, and he's teaching you while he's doing it and taking the pictures. And all of a sudden, everything gets serious. I mean, the camera crew gets serious. He gets serious. The whole tenor of the video changes, and, and it turns out that one, one of those strikes connected with his hand, and he's bleeding now. He got bit by a cobra. And he's spurting blood, and then the next thing you know, the, he, there's a video from the back of a Range Rover where he's, or Land Rover where he's in the back there with his finger spurting blood, and they got some kind of suction hooked up to it. He's taking uh, antivenom, and it, it was just everybody was, was on alert. You know, it was one of those situations. But then the next scene from the video, he's in a hospital bed, and the news was pretty good. Uh, the, the cobra did not insert so much as it scraped and nicked a blood vessel and when it nicked that blood vessel the blood is just spurting everywhere which is great because it's spewing whatever venom actually hit his finger it's spewing it back out and so he fared pretty well uh, when he could have had a pretty bad day that day 
and you know, I, I don't want any part of that. But, but when it comes to poisonous snakes, you can see where there really is a difference between an injection and a flesh wound, where one strikes down deep at the heart of your body, where the other just, it just makes a scrape, and, and you, can, you can deal with that, as this man did. And there's a difference there. Well, what we're going to talk about tonight is very similar. Uh, leprosy in the scriptures is dealt with in much the same way. There's a difference made in the scriptures between leprosy or what seems to be leprosy, but it's very external, and leprosy that has made its way down in the, the, into the deep parts of the flesh. Leprosy is, is the most common illness spoken of in the Bible, aside from certain forms of lameness. Leprosy is oftentimes related to sin sickness, and we're going to see that this evening. If you want to look at Leviticus 13 with me, the priests were taught how to evaluate leprosy and, and make this distinction. Uh, the, word, the law of Moses here to the priests, Leviticus 13 and verse 3 beginning, the priest shall examine the diseased area on the skin of his body, and if the hair in the diseased area has turned white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a case of leprous disease. When the priest has examined him, he shall pronounce him unclean. But if the spot is white in the skin of his body and appears no deeper than the skin, and the hair in it has not turned white, the priest shall shut up the diseased person for seven days. And the law goes on to, to, to evaluate different kinds of sores and what happens when leprosy gets into your building or into your clothing. And, and it all hinges on this. Is the damage superficial? Is it temporary? Or is it deep and is it lasting? That's the main difference in all of these laws. And it just, it amazes me, just number one, from the standpoint of all this medical knowledge that God was giving his people. Now, that alone is a proof for the inspiration of the Bible. Nobody else in their day had this kind of knowledge. Uh, but, but that was the difference. Is it, is it lasting or is it temporary? Because if it was lasting, if it was leprosy that had taken root in its victim, it was a death sentence. There was no coming back from that. You were going to die. It was going to slowly take your body, and you were cast out from society. If it was temporary, if it was external, you were quarantined. But hopefully you could make your way back into society. And as I said, there came to be this strong analogy in Scripture between leprosy and sin, between bodily sickness and sin sickness, and sin being a problem that we all face on the surface, but sin can take a deep root in the soul such that it causes a slow death sentence, just as leprosy does to the body. We recognize there's this dire need for healing because as sin rots away at our hearts, we simply must have a cure or we die. And so this evening we discuss the God who is a healer. Our God, he is a healer. Back to Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, what was just read if you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals you, the Lord your healer. God is a God who heals his people. In the context of this verse, we're talking about physical healing. In this context, uh, we're talking about the Egyptians, and there's one of two classes of thought on this particular passage, one of two meanings. Uh, the word diseases by some has considered to be figurative. They believe that we're talking about the ten plagues here and how the Hebrews, if they listened to God and kept his statutes, that he would keep them and protect them, unlike the Egyptians who did not keep his statutes, and so he brought these afflictions upon them, these ten plagues. And that is one uh, school of thought on this passage. Although there's nowhere else in the entire scripture where the plagues are referred to as diseases. And so kind of what I lean towards the other school of thought is that God is actually talking about real diseases, uh, infirmities, illnesses that the Egyptians had to deal with that the Hebrews did not have to deal with. Because God cared for his people and he taught him medical know-how like what we just read about. And if they followed his statutes, then they would have good health. They would not have sicknesses that others had. Uh, there is a book, um, 
S.I. McMillan back in the 1960s. He was a medical doctor. He wrote a book called None of These Diseases. And he goes through certain laws and statutes in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that if you will follow these, if you will follow the Word of God, you will avoid certain sicknesses that others would have if they did not have the Word of God. And so in a very real sense, yes, the, the Jewish dietary laws they kept God's people healthier than these Egyptians that had diseases that they did not have. And if you were a Jew back in those days, I can only imagine how some of these things might have seemed like such a burden. Why can't we have lobster? It looks so good. Why, why can't we have barbecue? Why can't we have all these things that other people can have? And it's such a burden to us. Well, you see, God was taking care of his people. God, through his providence, was taking care of his people through his laws. And God healed his people, in a sense, in that way, that he put none of these diseases upon them. Uh, He gives this indirect healing through his word. He directly gives healing through prayer, through miracles. Uh, You see in 2 Kings in chapter 20 how Hezekiah was said to be near death. He was going to die, and he prays, and through his tears, God sends him the healing that he desires. He gives him back 15 more years of health. And it's a miraculous healing and answer to prayer. Uh, You know how Jesus and the apostles conducted numerous miracles of healing. How they would heal the lame and the blind and the sick and the diseased, the leprous, those who had paralysis. They healed many, many diseases. And even as miracles cease, we see that Scripture teaches that there is still a providential healing that may still take place when we pray to God. He may still grant healing at the, at the bequest of our prayers. You look to uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 27. Paul is talking about Epaphroditus because he said, You Philippians, you heard that he was sick. And sure enough, he was sick. He was bad sick. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 27. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. It doesn't sound like this is a laying on of hands, miraculous healing that takes place through somebody who has that gift there. No, he said God had mercy on him. We prayed for him, much like I imagine Paul prayed for his thorn in the flesh, whatever that happened to be. And God answered this prayer in the affirmative. God had mercy on Epaphroditus. And we still pray to God today. When we have loved ones who have certain illnesses and infirmities, we pray for them, don't we? Because we believe that God can still grant healing even now. We realize that none of this means that believers have perfect health, that we don't have illnesses. Well, you just pray to God, and if you have enough faith, he's going to heal you. Well, that's not always the case. We realize that. In a fallen world, sickness, it's a reality. It's something that we deal with. And sometimes illness even gives greater spiritual benefit. We learn things. When we're leaning so heavily upon God in the midst of an illness. And sometimes God does not remove that thorn in our flesh. Even though we ask time and time again. God decides. And we trust our God that providentially he'll do what's best. But God is a healer. At all times we must know that. That God is a healer. He has the power to heal physically. But physical healing is not really the main thrust of our study tonight. Uh, Physical healing, it it benefits us in these few short years that we live upon this earth, but much, much greater than that, God is a healer of the Spirit. Look to Luke chapter 5 and verse 31 with me, because Jesus says something very important there for our study tonight. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, he's not talking about bodily illness now. Those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. As I said, with leprosy, there's a strong tie between sin, sickness, and bodily sickness in the scriptures. And Jesus said here, these sinners, they need healing, and I came as a physician to offer that healing. As a matter of fact, that's what the name Jesus even means. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Joshua, Yeshua. That's, the name means Jehovah saves. They're sin sick. And I came to save them from the sickness of their sins. Emmanuel, God with us coming down to heal his people, to save his people from their sins. And how did he do it? 
He did it on the cross. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. With his wounds we are healed. And to the great extent, the crucifixion of Christ addressed the problem of sin and brought us salvation. Salvation. That we can be with him forever. That the sin sickness that would have brought us ultimate death is alleviated and we can have life. But, but look again at Matthew one twenty one very closely. I want, to, I want us to look and see exactly what the text says. Exactly what the text says. He says, he will save his people from their sins. He will save them from what? From their sins. I, I think there's implications here that we are too quick to jump to too many times because he did not say he will save his people from the punishment due their sins. I believe that that's a true implication. I believe the Bible teaches that. I believe that we would be very true in saying that. But just the plain reading of the text, what does it say again? He will save his people from their sins. Hell is a bad thing. We look to Jesus and we are so thankful from the fact that he saves us from hell. Saves us from the punishment that we are due for our sins. But you know what? Jesus is offering something even better than that. Jesus doesn't want to just bail you out of the punishment and say, well, I know you sinned, I'm going to save you from that punishment there at the end. He wants to save you from the sin itself. You see the difference there? doesn't want to just save you from what is due to you because of your sin. He wants to save you from the sin itself. He wants to heal your way of living. He wants to really heal you as though sin were a leprosy and he's eradicating it from your body. He's pulling it out. And we need to keep this in mind and take on the mind of Christ and wholeheartedly desire this. It is so easy for us all too often to say, oh, I can't wait till Jesus saves me from the punishment of my sins. That's what I really want. Well, I really hope he leaves the sin around, though. It's fun to pull out and play with sometimes. Uh, I'm so glad Jesus is going to keep me from going to hell and he's going to take me to heaven when, when, I, when I'm there. And, and I'll put this sin up for a while. But every now and then, just to know it's there on the shelf, I'll pull it out and play with it. And that's what we kind of want. Can we take on the mind of Christ and want him to just take the, take the sin away altogether? Oh, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? If he took away that sin altogether, and not only was I saved and I was going to heaven, but I don't have to worry about that sin hanging around anymore. Jesus said he came to save them from their sins. If you look at Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9 is one of the most figurative uh, chapters in that book it's, it's kind of hard to navigate but in that chapter I believe it's the fifth trumpet which is blown and this pit opens up and smoke starts pouring out of that pit and out of the smoke come these really scary looking locusts and the locusts start attacking the people and stinging and biting the people but what the text says is, is it doesn't kill them it, it, it torments them and it says, in those days, men will look to die, but they will not find death. They'll want to die because of this torment, but they're not going to find death. The, 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 that's what sin is. I believe that this is an analogy in Revelation for what sin is. Sin torments us. It comes out of this blinding darkness. You may have heard this quote before. In this life, we're not so much punished for our sins as we're punished by our sins. Sin in and of itself is a torment. It's a punishment. It's something I don't want to live with. I don't think any of us really want to live with it. And sin is a torment. Jesus, the healing God, would come down and save us from our sins. Not just so that we can be done with it at the end, at the end but he would take them away now. He would take away our sins. I believe our, our evangelism needs to be a reflection of this truth also. I've heard some, uh, and it's usually a misguided question, but all the same, I've heard some ask, do you think that the churches of Christ focus too heavily on baptism? And, and my answer is, well, it depends on what you're talking about there. If you really understand baptism for what it is, then no. I, how could you focus too heavily upon the saving blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? How could you do that? But I kind of know what they're asking usually when they ask it. You know, we, we come back from campaigns, we come back from evangelistic efforts, and it's so always, always so exciting to talk about how many came to the Lord. 
What was the count of our baptisms? And we focus so much on how many were baptized. And I think there's a danger there. There's a danger we need to be aware of, and I think we are aware of it. But there's a danger there in focusing so much on let's just get them baptized, get them baptized so that we can pump that number up. And we forget that we need to convert them too. It's not just about calling them a Christian. It's about healing the way of life. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, what is baptism exactly? Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not a removal from dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Unless one comes to baptism as an appeal for a good conscience, as I want to leave this sinful life behind, I want Jesus to save me from my sins, I want to change my life, I want them to heal my way of life. Unless it's that, well, we're just getting them wet. And I don't think we do that here. But understand that's what the questioner is usually after. We have to teach what baptism, what conversion truly is. It's Jesus healing your way of life. We need to be aware of false teachers, false healers. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 and following. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. And from the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly. They have healed the wound of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, and there's no peace. When the body's been stricken by a snake bite, a Band-Aid won't do it. That's saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, there's a sickness raging within, and that body is going to die. When a person has leprosy, just cleaning the sores off, it ain't going to do it. There's a sickness raging within And superficial healing is not going to do anything for it. Spiritually, we have to guard against false, superficial, light healings. Uh, Just come sing with us how I love Jesus. Uh, Just come get wet. Just come to the building on Sunday. Just, Just make a confession. It's all good and right. But are they converted? Have they come to Jesus, save me from my sins, take these away from me, change my way of life? And he does that through his word. He does that as we dedicate our lives to knowing his word, giving ourselves to him and praying and doing what we see in the word. That's a conversion. That is a true healing. And God, our healer, is glad to do it. This, this evening, if you've been living a life that's been plagued by sin... God is your healer. God stands ready to heal you. The healing God would save you from your sins. And if you're not a child today, he stands ready. So oftentimes our society doesn't understand the big Bible words. Sin is a Bible word. So oftentimes you go out there and they don't understand what you're talking about. But you start talking about brokenness and everybody understands. No matter what your moral code is, people will oftentimes admit What I know to do, I still don't even do that. I need somebody to heal me. I'm broken. I need a healer. And God stands ready this very evening to give you just that. If you're not a Christian, come to this healer. If you are a child but you've resisted the healing, he would take away your sin, but you don't want him to. You you, you want the eventual healing. You want the ultimate healing and saving from death and hell. But, But leave that sin right here on the shelf so I can pull it out every now and then. If you're a child of God, but you haven't allowed Jesus to save you from your sins, if there's anything that you need to flee from this evening, if you have any need to come, please come while we stand and while we sing.